morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the AI for Good Global Summit, all year, always online. My name is Ksenia Fontaine from the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar on AI and financial inclusion. Now, the ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. And we are also the organizers of the AI for Good Global Summit alongside XPRIZE Foundation and in partnership with 37 UN sister agencies, ACM and Cochrane with Switzerland. The goal of the summit is to identify the practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale those solutions for global impact. Like the most of the world, the AI for Good Summit has gone digital with a weekly programming allowing us to reach even more people across the globe. And before I introduce today's moderator, let me go over some housekeeping rules. If you wish, wish to ask a question, please submit it to the Q&A tab. The moderator will select and read out the questions to the panelists. And we are particularly counting on your participation to create a very engaging discussion. And speaking about interactive, here is the first challenge for you. Could you please let us know from which country or city you are calling? and just send your message to the chat uh, and make sure to enable it to everyone. And let me do this first. So I'm calling from Geneva. Okay, so it's going really fast. We have people calling from London, Spain, Barcelona, Sweden, USA, Brussels. Fantastic, welcome everyone. And now I would like to introduce our moderator. Her name is LJ Rich. She's an inventor, artist, and one of the presenters of a very popular TV show, BBC Click. LJ, welcome. And the show is all yours. Hello there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? I hope you can. Uh, my name is LJ Rich. As Ksenia said, I'm TV presenter, music artist, and AI composer. And I've been monitoring global technology trends for some time now. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. And this is part of the AI for Good Global Summit, which is virtual this year. Throughout this panel, we love your interactions and questions and chats are all allowed. So thank you so much for choosing to spend the next hour with us. Those of you hearing the term financial inclusion for the first time, one way to explain it is everyone can afford secure financial services and products at affordable prices. And they could be deposits, fund transfer services, loans, insurance, payment services, even a bank account. But as an example, if you don't have a permanent address, how can you get a bank account? And that's financial inclusion here. It also means not paying extra to access the same financial services as wealthier people. And many studies show that this would, in fact, boost prosperity for everyone. And it's an enabler for seven of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. So our panel today is going to rock. It promises a fascinating insight into what's happening and what's possible with some formidable panelists. As usual with these events, we're reaching around the globe, Singapore, Canada, London. Uh, so good morning, afternoon and evening to everybody joining us. And thank you to you, our ever engaged international audience too. So it's time to introduce our guests for today. Please turn your video and audio on and imagine a round of applause for Rory McMillan from McMillan Keck Attorneys and Solicitors, Kamaljit Singh from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Alexandra Ritzi, Senior Research Director, Center for Financial Inclusion, Axion. Welcome folks, thank you all so much for joining. So what we're going to do is we'll start with a five minute talk from each panelist. Kamaljit, you're going to be up first. Thank you for joining us, take it away. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be a part of this uh, panel discussion on AI and financial inclusion. Uh, for me, both of these terms pack a lot of complexity. While uh, AI represents the cutting edge of software and computing, uh, financial inclusion highlights the stark reality that approximately 1.7 billion people in the world are still unbacked and don't have access to formal financial services. The shockwave from the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the importance of digital connectivity and the ability of governments, private sector, and development organizations to rapidly provide assistance through digital channels and financial accounts. So let me begin uh, with a brief introduction of the financial services for the poor strategy. 
I hope you can see the slides. Uh, you know? Thank you. So I'm part of a, a team called the Financial uh, Services for the Poor Initiative. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, begin with the introduction of what are its objectives and why AI may have the potential to significantly impact them. Uh, next one. All lives have equal value. Uh, these five powerful words are uh, what I saw every day as uh, we entered our office in Seattle. And they continue to inspire me and my fellow impatient optimist colleagues every day. This is a guiding principle that underpins the foundation's work across all its strategies. Our team's objective is to make markets work for the poor, take risks that others can't or won't take and fight poverty through sustainable uh, economy-wide efficiencies. Affordable and accessible digital financial services delivered through mobile connectivity is a core enabler of our strategy. Uh, we uh, operationalize our strategy through three uh, major pillars. Uh, so the first pillar focuses on enabling uh, and strengthening regulation and policy environment to widen access and participation. The second one attempts to uh, expand the identity and payments infrastructure to create the rails that deliver low cost and interoperable financial services. And the third one encourages participation of market providers to create innovative products and services that serve the poor who can then begin to use these to capture the opportunities that a formal financial system has to offer. If we look at the needs that lie at the core of digital financial inclusion, they are basically to drive down the costs of serving the poor, ensure customer centricity in the delivery of these financial services through uh, protection, grievance redressal, support, and clear information about products that suits the need of the poor. But all of this needs to be done while balancing the new and complex risk landscape that arises because of new players, channels, business models, value chains, and last but not least, uh, the digital risks like cybersecurity, data privacy, fraud, algorithmic bias, et cetera. So I see a lot of potential for AI applications uh, to make a significant impact in all these areas. Um, and with that, I hand it back to LJ. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic way to start. Uh, I really appreciate the way that you laid out the landscape there. Next up, let's have Alexandra. Thank you. Sure. Thanks so much, LJ. Uh, and thank you for the invitation, ITU. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, happy Thanksgiving to those of you who are celebrating it. Uh, I'm Alex Rizzi, a Senior Director of Research at the Center for Financial Inclusion um, and based in the, the Washington, D.C. area. Just for a little bit of background on CFI, the Center for Financial Inclusion is a think tank within Axion International, and we work on research, uh, testing solutions, and evidence-based advocacy to advance financial inclusion. And some of the thematic areas where we are engaged and plan to continue to do research are around responsible data practices, uh, climate change, and financial inclusion, gender and financial inclusion, and consumer protection. And on that latter front, uh, we have about uh, 10 years of experience in consumer protection um, and standard setting for the inclusive uh, financial services field. And in that area last year, we put out uh, a series of uh, initial recommendations or good practices as it relates to digital credit and financial inclusion and had some elements in there that address some of the, the opportunities and risks um, for the use of algorithms and AI um, in digital credit. And I think Connell uh, laid out, I think, you know, beautifully sort of the, the, the larger picture of the opportunity for, for AI and financial inclusion. Um, uh, a Bankable Frontier report called um, some of these applications practical superpowers. And uh, we absolutely see the potential for, for AI as uh, time-saving, cost-saving ways to make better decisions and expand economic opportunity, whether it's uh, uh, for providers who are using innovative underwriting methods to um, advance products and uh, digital credit to the unbanked or regulators who are using uh, advanced AI and machine learning techniques for fraud detection and uh, market monitoring. 
Um, but while we feel that the industry has made the, um, you know, kind of the use case and the opportunity case um, uh, for the use of AI, um, at CFI, we're, we're focused on engaging more deeply and deliberately with how these tools are being developed and deployed um, and how they can be done as responsibly as possible given their application with low income and vulnerable consumers. And we have a set of research questions and uh, lines of inquiry that we intend to pursue and are pursuing uh, in this area, whether it's um, how, uh, how to effectively proxy for repayment capacity and affordability um, when you have sort of an incomplete uh, financial picture of a potential borrower from how to avoid uh, uh, further entrenching societal biases in the deployment of these uh, systems. Um, and you know, from articulating some of the risks to uh, thinking about what are some tools for accountability um, for providers and other actors that could be leveraged and, and, um, and used as these technologies really outpace um, uh, kind of traditional guardrails around uh, data protection and um, consumer protection. And we don't say this to be naysayers or a wet blanket, but really because we feel like this is an important lens in an environment when uh, the, you know, as Kamal Jeet said, that as the um, uh, number of new players are growing, as the number of digital kind of immigrants or people who are onboarding into financial services, digital financial services is increasing, especially in the aftermath of, you know, and, and in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, where the technologies are changing so fast. And we're leveraging CFI's track record in consumer protection in this area. And right now we're doing some research um, on uh, responsible uh, algorithms and, uh, and talking to different industry players to better understand the state of practice. And just one of the things that just makes this topic so interesting to me personally is uh, the opportunity to pop um, pop my head out of the traditional financial inclusion set of players because actors across sectors are grappling with uh, these questions and how to um, design responsible AI systems, whether it's in criminal justice or, or healthcare. Um, and while you know what's fair or responsible in criminal justice may look different in the weeds as, uh, as compared to financial inclusion, there are a lot of universal questions around data quality, data sources, uh, monitoring of these systems, um, how to get inside the black box that I think are universal. And so it's really fun to engage with um, AI frameworks and data ethicists and thinkers who are uh, outside the financial inclusion space. So it's a pleasure to be here today and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Alex. And yes, the idea of looking outside of a traditional financial inclusion bubble is absolutely a, a brilliant reason to, to find out from other industries what's happening. Those of you watching who might want to dig into AI ethics a little bit more might enjoy uh, Stuart Russell. I think he's a Californian professor who has quite a lot to say on AI and ethics, and I would absolutely recommend you check out some of his thoughts. Um, thank you, Alex. And now we're on to our final panellist for the day. It's Rory. Thank you so much, Rory. Off you go. Hi, good afternoon, morning, evening. Um, I'm Rory McMillan. I'm a lawyer, a tech uh, lawyer, do a lot of fintech work with governments and with fintech companies in a lot of different uh, countries. And recently we um, uh, worked with the ITU as part of the Financial Inclusion Global Initiative studying uh, AI and consumer protection. Um, and there's a report available on the Fiji FIGI uh, website as on, the, on the ITU um, system. I just want to start us off. As a lawyer, of course, we're thinking about regulation, regulatory frameworks. And when you think about regulation, you think about risks. What are you trying to regulate for, govern for? What are the problems? So I'm just going to kick us off with a scenario and see if you can guess, if you can log in uh, uh, onto menti.com and put in the number on your screen, which should be showing. Um, just imagine um, we're in a country with a history of bias and discrimination against certain population groups. Uh, imagine a health insurance company that give points, gives points for checking your blood pressure, your blood glucose, your cholesterol, your weight, your waist circumference, gives you a wearable band on your wrist that monitors every step and heartbeat, 
It awards you more points for the number of steps that you take every day or withholds points if you don't. It requires you to do a minimum number of hours of cardio exercise a week, measures that uh, against a target cardio rate, which it calculates by subtracting your age from uh, 220. It gives you points and withholds them if you don't meet the minimum exercise target, reminds you, it nudges you if the week is drawing to a close and you're short of the three hours of exercise that you're supposed to have done. Now imagine this health insurance company is also a bank. Every purchase you make using the bank card is monitored and you get points when you buy vegetables and it withholds points when you buy chocolate. The amount of the points that you earn affects the price of your insurance, including your health insurance. Prizes are thrown in like 30% off a holiday at the beach. And the bank gets access to your device data on your steps, the heartbeat, but also your health data. And you can, and it takes all of that into account when it assesses your credit score when you ask for a loan. Where are we? Well, we're in South Africa. This is the um, Vitality uh, health insurance provided by Discovery in South Africa. And so what does this tell us? This tells us that we are in a world in which AI is being used now globally in a wide range of uh, countries and economies. And it is uh, being um, used where it is allowed to be used without uh, tight restrictions, data protection laws and restrictions on use of AI are, are really not yet enforced effectively in South, in South Africa. Um, and so these are the sorts of scenarios that we need to be aware of and, and thinking about what sorts of risks might these present in terms of the aggregation of uh, data uh, sources, what is going further than privacy should allow, how does one ensure accuracy of the data, how does one avoid bias creeping in. Um, so those are some of the issues that I expect that will come up uh, later on. I don't think one should lead with risks unless the entire panel is about risks, but it's not about that today. But I'm sure we'll get to these later on. So it's a pleasure to be with you and thank you very much for the invitation to the ITU. Back to you, Yanji. Thank you, thank you, Rory, and all of our panelists. So my goodness, that's a really good start, isn't it? And um, we're going to continue by having a conversation with all of our panelists. So please return back if you were speaking earlier, Alex, uh, please turn on your video camera. And audience, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I can see them and I will be asking them as and when it fits. So let's go to our first section today, which is AI and innovations. Uh, and we're gonna talk, first of all, about the innovations in digital credit and and digital lending. Rory, I'm aware you've done quite a lot on mobile financial services, and I know that you've just finished your five minutes of talking, but I think it's a really good idea to start our next section. So please, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, innovations in digital credit and digital lending? Well, sure. I mean, three kind of fundamental things that uh, a lender needs to wrestle with when deciding to extend credit or not are identifying the borrower, accurately, evaluating their credit risk uh, in light of their credit history, and then perhaps taking some sort of collateral. And a huge um, part of the world's population, particularly those in the bottom level of the pyramid, uh, are unable to um, deliver any of those three. They can't identify themselves simply. They may be lacking foundational identification documents. Um, they, they may have little or no credit history whatsoever and may have nothing to put up as collateral. And the um, benefits that AI has been um, bringing, I think, as a matter of financial inclusion primarily, um, are uh, solving, solving these problems, um, particularly uh, getting around the, the challenges of identification um, using tiered KYC sort of approaches that allow uh, an easier um, a way of, of, of identifying people using face recognition and, and uh, uh, then also using data that's aggregated from a lot of their uh, activities. And Briefly, also just to interrupt, uh, KYC, for those of you watching, is know your customer. It's a set of regulations. Um, sorry, you. continue. Yes, yes. And, and um, being able to build uh, data history on the most rudimentary of digital activities, which may be as basic as your social network, as, as uh, as shown on your telephone calls and your cash flow as shown in your top ups of those calls, which can then build into further 
um, data. That's been a very important uh, uh, driver of, of use of AI in um, uh, financial inclusion. AI is also being used um, uh, in bigger ways. In fact, that is not the driving use of AI in, in, in financial services. Anomaly detection, which reduces uh, improves the ability to, to detect fraud is very um, increasingly used. Natural language um, processing, NLP they call it, is also being used to communicate with um, uh, consumers, including in their own language. You see the likes of MTN um, using Momo in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire to, to, to be able to do that. And so there are a number of different innovations that are going on, but I think in terms of financial inclusion and reaching those who truly have a blockage to getting in at all to the financial uh, sector, um, the, the, the analytics of credit history and bringing people on board by identifying them better is, is, a, is a real driver. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Kamwaji, I'm going to come to you, actually, because we've got some really interesting stuff coming up around, well, income equality, um, as well as financial inclusion. And I guess we're going to talk later about uh, privacy, but in, in terms of you, you've got a world view there with the, the nature of the Gates Foundation and it's funding several different projects across the world on financial improvement, uh, improvement, inclusion even. So um, please, can you tell us your thoughts on you know, digital credit, digital lending? Yeah, thank you, LJ. Uh, so Rory made some excellent points. Uh, the use of AI technologies have many applications ranging from um, looking at identity and uh, calculating risk or uh, uh, tokenizing collateral. But if we look at digital credit uh, alone um, and look at applications of AI there, on the one hand, there is no denying that it's a very important entry point uh, for a large number of poor. Uh, digital credit is quite uh, important to onboard them onto the platforms. But then again, a problem that we run into often is um, over indebtedness. How do we prevent uh, predatory lending? Um, how do we ensure that the loan products being sold to vulnerable populations uh, are actually suitable for them? And remember, these are populations uh, which already have a lot of barriers. You have digital literacy, uh, financial literacy, uh, lack of understanding of what products are being sold. So if you were to separate the uh, product, uh, AI driven products into the front end and the back end, there's a huge mismatch there. Um, what impact it has on poverty alleviation, I think the jury is still out. Uh, so like every other technology, I think it's an experiment in progress. Um, and we are getting data from the field from all over the world uh, on what impact AI technologies are having, uh, especially digital credit in uh, poor sections of the society to see if it has any long lasting effects on poverty alleviation uh, is a question that, that I frankly don't have the answer to, but I would love to find it out. I think the whole point of having panels like this is to open a conversation. I mean, it's, it's evident that no one's got the answers yet, but I really like the idea of just by having this conversation, we, we could start some powerful changes and movements. So um, I appreciate the thoughts there. And I mean, AI is a fascinating area anyway. For example, in loans, you could work out someone's ability to pay back a loan based on an analysis of the social media profiles. And uh, I mean, there's there's a lot around here. Alex, it feels like I should be bringing you in around this area because we're, we're just touching on consumer privacy here. I'm pretty certain that quite a few people would be happy to give up a little bit of privacy in exchange for a more favorable loan rate. Yeah, it's it's really interesting the the trade offs that that people make, um, and I think you know global surveys show that uh, I think increasingly people are are willing to uh, you know trade uh, trade off some of their data to to achieve access to a, a particular service or product, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's 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 a good thing for them all the time and. I, I did want to, you mentioned LJ sort of social media, and I think just this one thing I wanted to touch on was the kind of explosion of alternative data that's being used by these AI systems um, uh, to, to you know, we're talking about digital credit here. So as a source for underwriting and deciding who's uh, a potentially good borrower, and it's just so fascinating to think about how the you know democratization of mobile phones has just allowed uh, people to create more data trails for themselves and 
to be able to um, be visible in some ways um, to put to providers and other actors to, to offer services. But one of the things that that we've been thinking about in the the use of alternative data um, uh, and, and it's interesting to even kind of how to even define alternative data. We've been talking to different providers for our research and they've said that kind of the Overton window has shifted so much um, that what might have been considered alternative a few, you know, even a few short years ago is, is you know, is increasingly uh, incorporated into to underwriting. Um, I think one, uh, you know, FinTech CEO famously said, all, all data is credit data, but, you know, we sort of wonder, um, you know, from a few angles, uh, uh, in terms of data quality, um, you know, there aren't the same kinds of standards or rigor in ensuring accuracy um, for some of these alternative data sources. And, you know, there have been research that, that looked at the uh, kind of the the data being traded and, and purchased through data brokers and found them kind of riddled with inaccuracies. And so, you know, if you think about um, garbage in, garbage out, you know, if 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 some of the inferences that are being made about um, someone's credit worthiness uh, is based on alternative data that's inaccurate or not really painting a full picture, you, you know, that that requires a bit more scrutiny. And and we've thought a lot about this also in the context of of the potential for for bias and um, and as much as uh, the democratization of mobile phones allows for populations who were, you know, perhaps invisible to become more visible, there are certain um, uh, you know societal dynamics that we think might be perpetuated. Um, you know, for instance, if you think about the the click streams or the data trails that are created by different demographics, we know that that women in low and middle income countries are are less likely to own a mobile phone than men, um, less likely to uh, use the use mobile internet, less likely to use their phones for kind of sophisticated tasks that might generate a click stream that could then be leveraged by a provider to to offer them a product. And so thinking about um, uh, who is who who gets visible through these different um, data trails and who might still be left out, um, uh, I think is is an important dynamic that 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 we're look you know we think um, should be discussed by the industry. Yeah, that's fascinating insight, actually. And for those who are wondering what the Overton window is, it's basically the range of things that are politically OK at any given time. And yes, it does shift. So a really good example would be a few years ago, I visited a theme park in the UK. I was filming for the show and uh, they were offering free tickets in exchange for likes on Facebook. And the people inside the park were really happy to share their data with this theme park in exchange for one free ticket. And, you know, a few years before that, that would have been unthinkable. So I think there is this opportunity for us to be responsible and start moving the range of access acceptability in in an area that, that we find more comfortable i'm i'm wondering um of just talking a little about the challenges of innovating in this area how do we get authorities to collaborate you know, how do you get providers for example to do um account to account interoperability these companies are all vying for place on somebody's mobile phone you know if you've got mobile phone banking and company one would like you to use their product how how do you get them to interact with company two this is probably quite a big start I'm, I'm presuming this might be a regulation question so Rory I suspect that you are unmuting as we speak yes well it's a challenge and um what, what, the opportunity of growing financial inclusion is often driven by the commercial um, uh, profit that providers will achieve. And if they're able to achieve that um, by maintaining a dominance in the market, um, and we see this with some telecom operators, for instance, um, uh, who are also offering mobile money, and then through that with platformed uh, uh, partnerships with banks, they may be able to corner the market in digital credit. Um, uh, there, there is a then potential risk of um, of them really uh, dominating that and consumers not having an extensive choice. Um, interoperability that really comes into where the payment systems uh, function across uh, whether you can introduce different payment systems, allowing money to be transferred between different platforms and different 
uh, accounts and that's where you need to bring in competition authorities who need to talk to financial regulators central banks and and sometimes telecom authorities to to work out how to uh, um, impose interoperability requirements another uh, solution that is being introduced not in very many low-income countries because it's very heavy um, and bureaucratic administratively is uh, open banking where uh, you require um, the financial institution to make the data it has uh, about its customers available to competing providers. Um, this is um, really targeting the more established incumbent banks where the data they've accumulated is seen as a barrier for new up and coming, up and coming uh, firms. Perhaps it's not so directly relevant to financial inclusion, but that is you know, another mechanism for trying to get uh, uh, competition um, going. Um, can I just come back briefly to the privacy point that you raised earlier, which is this trade-off between um, uh, privacy and, and uh, access to services? I think it's a really interesting question. There was a study that um, CGAP did. CGAP is the Collaborative Group Against Poverty um, last year, uh, looking at um, to the degree to which uh, people in lower income countries will indeed trade off privacy, meaning allowing access to their data. Um, in exchange for access to um, a, uh, a product. And they, they um, asked um, a, a pool of, um, of subjects in, uh, I think in Bangladesh and Kenya, if I remember correctly, um, whether they would be prepared uh, firstly to wait an extra period of time to get access to the loan. Um, and they, you know, they ran behavioral uh, economic studies on, on, on this live, um, uh, and they found that a lot of people were willing to wait the equivalent of uh, in a line in order to get a, uh, assurance that their data would not be um, uh, freely used by the entity they were providing it to, um, to get a more secure privacy protection. Similarly, some of them were prepared, a significant amount were prepared to accept a higher price on their, on their loan, um, which suggests that there is some sensitivity to this, um, even in, in population groups who you would expect really to be very hungry and just to be concerned about access um, to the product. You know, the exact sensitivities of this, I think uh, the market's gonna be the, the one that tells us and we'll, we'll find out really whether companies start adapting their products to be a bit more uh, privacy uh, respectful and see if it's really a competitive uh, attribute that's worth them pursuing or not. I suspect we shouldn't be too rosy glassed about it, um, but it's certainly in play. And that's really fascinating to find that, you know, that sense of liberty of the privacy is, you know, it ranks so high in terms of what we feel is acceptable. Um, I mean, it is hard to find a balance and, and Cam Wild, I'm going to bring you in here. How do you find this balance? You don't want to under-regulate, you don't want to over-regulate. I know that you're funding a project in Egypt, for example, where there is an incredibly low take up of people with bank accounts. So how, how do you navigate this elegantly? Um, I think in, when, when the challenges of innovation, uh, it's not that straightforward, even from a technology perspective. Uh, because Alex talked about uh, people are willing to give up a bit of privacy for getting something in return, but that assumes uh, a world in which people understand what will be done with their data. Now, I remember days when cookies just meant being delicious. Then cookies started to meet other things. I still don't know how these might be used. So to say that people are willing to give up with their data without understanding what harms may come from it is not really setting the field in their favor. And in addition to the regulatory fragmentation that Rory talked about, even from a technology perspective, there are very strong ethical questions. So for example, uh, explainability, when a, an adverse decision is taken by an AI algorithm, which learns from different sets of data, which even the programmer cannot explain how it arrived at that conclusion. So how, does, how do we explain it to the consumer as to why that adverse decision was taken? So from a technology perspective, the conversation keeps coming back to data and what to do with the data. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges in innovating in this area where some of the concepts uh, such as data or privacy, their definitions are not well settled. I mean, we talk about privacy, but there is no universal standardized definition of privacy. We don't know what it means. Uh, we, do, we do talk about protecting it, 
but we don't talk about you uh, using privacy for empowerment. I think we need to be asking the questions of uh, are the poor impacted more by too much privacy or are they paying the cost of, of too much protection of privacy? And, oh. and that line is not very clear uh, in the conversation today because even technologies are themselves evolving. This whole idea of having uh, an algorithm or a program uh, today is a very different one because today algorithms can travel. If you look at federated learning, they are traveling from place to place, computer to computer, uh, aggregating data and learning in ways that the humans uh, don't understand how they are arriving at their decisions. So I think balancing all of this uh, would require regulators and technologists to start speaking each other's language. So as part of my job at the Gates Foundation, I came in as a technologist, but, but I had to learn how to speak regulation. Um, and hopefully uh, we can um, get the regulators to learn how to speak technology so we can come at some joint understanding of what these terms mean computationally and legally. I mean, this, what you've just said has really inspired me to think about this idea of privacy as something that's quantifiable in the same way that you've got a happiness index, for example, or you've got currency. I mean, there's this transaction that we as consumers have been unaware of, I think, for, for many, many years. If your email is free, then it's likely that you are not the customer, you are the product. We, we know all about this. And with the advent of AI and these sort of little sort of black boxes where you don't quite know what goes on in the middle, you just put some rest. You, you know, you put some ingredients in one end and then a, something that hopefully resembles a cake comes out the other. And it really depends on the ingredients that you put in at the beginning, whether or not the cake actually is to your taste. And I do think that we're, we're sort of on the edge of some really interesting thoughts here on is it possible to quantify the sort of privacy that is, you know, universally acceptable to sort of head briefly back to the Overton window. I'm just going to leave that there hanging whilst we move on to another section because you all knew we were going to get here but risk and Rory I, I know that this is something that uh, would possibly be something you could spend the whole hour on but just give us a, a brief talk about that. Wow well privacy is one we've, we've just talked about and um, but uh, another I think is back to this notion of explainability um, how do you ensure, I mean, Alexandra mentioned earlier, there's this concern about the data that's, be, that's being drawn into AI systems, and how do, you, how do you ensure the quality of that, the age of it, that it's kept up to date? We're in a very wild, um, wild west kind of data world where you've got um, a lot of data brokers buying and selling lists of individuals with different attributes, and many of them are out of date. And how much does it matter to the provider that they um, may simply have poor data that's, that's being used as training data for running the algorithms when analyzing a person? Mm -hmm. um, well, it ought to matter. Let's at least remind ourselves it ought to matter because the better their data uh, analytics are, the better their uh, decisions will be when extending credit, um, the, the better their um, uh, non-performing loan rates should be, the higher their profits should be. So there ought to be a technical, technological and, and, and market um, uh, driver for good improving quality. However, um, there are going to be plenty uh, of providers who are still experimenting, haven't got the discipline, the training, haven't integrated the ethicists yet, uh, who, are, who are still producing poor results. And um, I think as Kamalji said, you know, this explainability theme, which Alexander also mentioned at the beginning, is, is a really important part of accountability. How do you hold uh, providers accountable for um, the results that are coming out? If it's bias, for example, that's everywhere, you're going to have a major problem. Um, there, there are, you know, a lot of technologists will tell you there is a trade-off between the explainability of a system and... Uh, it's accuracy. The more accurate you're trying to make it, the more levels of deep learning you're going into, um, the harder it is going to be to explain that, the result to, um, to the, the, the customer or to the regulator. So there, there, there are these trade-offs. You may need to document decisions made in there. Um, there are some interesting ideas, just to close on this point, about ex explainability that are coming out. Uh, Sandra Wachter and Brett Mitterstadt at the, the Oxford Internet Institute have come up with the idea of using counterfactuals to explain because why do we care about explainability? What does the customer really need to know? The customer really needs to know what he or she could do differently to get the result they want. 
And it might be stop smoking, you'll get the health insurance product. Or uh, if you earned a few more thousand a year, you'd be able to get the loan. Um, one might be able to use some counterfactuals um, in the system so that the customer could understand better uh, by modifying some variables, how they might be able to get different results. So there is some interesting work being done there, um, but it's, it's uh, certainly going to be a challenge going forward. Thanks, Rory. Alex, I, I feel like it would be really good to get your feelings on risk and accountability. Sure. Yeah, I think Rory and and uh, and Kamaljeet have, have kind of articulated, and we've talked a little bit about some of the risks. I, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about um, accountability and how we're thinking about it, uh, especially in this time that, uh, as Kamaljeet said, the you know the providers and regulators are learning to speak each other's languages, and you know it will likely be some time before there are, uh, you know, robust. Kind of regulatory uh, solutions, and in that interim, you know what what are what are some tools for accountability, and where can it come from? And just just on just wanted to speak a bit on the uh, on kind of the black box nature of some of these systems. And I think uh, as we started to approach this topic, we kind of came from the angle of uh, they're completely you know these these uh, decision systems are completely opaque, especially with some of the machine learning applications and AI, as Rory said, even sometimes the developer themselves, they, they don't completely understand the logic of how they've gotten to a certain decision. And that, you know, we started, it's, we started off being a bit intimidated by that, like, how can we actually advance, you know, responsible practices, but the way that we've been thinking about it, which is a bit drawn from our work on consumer protection is on kind of different management systems that the provider can have in place beyond the actual algorithm or AI system themselves in terms of supporting, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, responsible practices. And that starts from, you know, who, who decides what data sources are appropriate, how, how, what assumptions are made about what that data is proxying for and in, you know, in the, in the algorithm, who decides what training data sets are uh, appropriate. Um, you know, we've talked to a number of providers who just, uh, you know, because of budget constraints or their startups, you know, they often use the same training data set as they move from market to market. Um, who, who monitors the outcomes of the system? Who looks for, you know, if there are differential impacts? A lot of those things beyond the actual kind of black box, you know, AI uh, system itself, a lot of those decisions are made by humans, are, um, uh, can be documented, discussed, uh, discussed with external actors. And so I think there is a lot that can be um, touched upon and um, improved. Uh, and formalized in terms of documentation around these systems uh, mm. beyond actually getting to the, the, the secret sauce. And we've seen a few um, examples of other kind of levers of influence. Um, CFI is just about to put out a, a paper where we looked at the, uh, that drew from about 400 fintechs um, as part of our, uh, the MIX um, CFI uh, inclusive fintech 50 competition. And so we were looking at correlations between external funding sources and, and um, data protection measures. And so, uh, for example, 72% um, uh, of self-funded fintechs had informed consent mecha mechanisms in place, but that increased to 81% of those that had seed or angel uh, investors, and then 85% of those uh, fintechs that had venture level series investors had informed consent. And then taking it even further, uh, only 50% of self-funded fintechs gave customers the ability to revoke consent, while 59% of uh, seed or angel level fintechs uh, gave their consumers that option. And 76% of fintechs that uh, were venture funded gave their consumers the ability to revoke consent. And so this correlation between having external funding and, you know, improved or more robust, not perfect, but, you know, robust, one element of it, data protection practices, um, you know, to us sets up, uh, you know, conversation about what role investors and other industry um, actors can have in influencing their portfolio, influencing the companies they're working with, you know, maybe as regulatory, uh, systems and uh you know measures are being set up so 
I think there's something really in both ways it's reassuring that uh, the projects with informed consent built in are getting more funded and I also feel that the sense of social responsibility is actually it, it's it's great optics for the, the the company it's almost like a slightly cynical look but yes you know if it, if it looks good but also it, it is good it's AI for good then it's it's actually really quite amazing statistics that you've that you've shown there and hopefully anybody who's watching who's building systems at the moment will obviously hopefully move towards including informed consent as part of that build now i'm aware of the time and we've got a sort of fantastic amount of questions but before that i just want to go back to cam Wildjet for just a little bit about some regional focus some specific examples of what's happening around the world right now um. Thank you, LJ. Uh, before I go to specific uh, examples, I wanted to touch on informed consent a little bit. Of course. Um, part of the reason that informed consent is so interesting is because it operates like a catch-all phrase where uh, basically the assumption is as long as there is informed consent, we are good to go. But if I were to ask the audience today, how many have clicked I agree uh, without ever having reading the document of what they're agreeing to? Um, we would figure out new ways of how 99% approach is 100. Um, and this problem becomes even more pronounced when we are talking about populations uh, who are consenting to things uh, that they don't understand, uh, that haven't been explained to them very well. And frankly, some of the things are so complex that even the creators of those things don't have good ways of explaining them. So this whole idea of notice and consent, uh, to me, doesn't feel like driving accountability it seems like shifting liabilities. Uh, it, it seems to be a way of saying that, oh, by the way, it's your bad from now on, now that you have clicked the informed consent button. Um, so having said that, uh, as part of uh, uh, our work in, in different countries, we look at the technologies as they proliferate across Africa, across Southeast Asia. This is where most populations who lack an ID are. This is where most populations who lack bank accounts are. And uh, what we find is that a lot of these uh, new technologies go in with a, with a lot of fanfare, uh, but there's not that much impact on the ground. So for me, the more interesting part is how do these technologies help drive lower costs? Because at the end of the day, the, the cake, as you called out, um, the proof is in the pudding. Um, if these technologies can help lower costs, uh, through innovative mechanisms, we should see uh, growth in markets uh, which are able to serve the poor profitably. And I think that's what I look forward to the most. How would these technologies be integrated in, in, in specific systems um, such that these costs can be lowered? So we've already seen a lot of examples, not, uh, not in digital credit, but let's say in customer service. Uh, these uh, chatbot driven systems which look at customer complaints, um, developments in voice technologies and uh, natural language processing where people can um, talk about their grievances and uh, providers and regulators can act upon them. So all of these elements are coming together to lower the cost of the whole system. And I think that's what matters. So if we look at a global focus, uh, I think lowering cost should be a key, key barrier in, in how do we uh, serve the poor and onboard themselves onto formal financial services. It's brilliant. Uh, if I could, sorry, go on, Alex. Sorry, I just I just wanted to jump in. Just wanted to say I I very much agree, um, Kamalji, with sort of your uh, with the kind of critique of informed consent, um, and I think, yeah, especially with the the kind of wild west as we've talked about about the data ecosystem, sort of, you know, that as a as a tool or sort of as the only tool that providers use to do whatever they want with uh, consumers' data, I think is is insufficient and also a lot of these regulatory frameworks rely heavily on still rely heavily kind of GDPR and GDPR inspired frameworks and a lot of the markets where we're working that rely heavily on consent. I think my point was just to say that kind of investors and um, the industry can have can have a lever of influence and incentives on how providers are you know, are managing AI and algorithms and informed consent was the example, but I think it should go much further in the future for sure. Yeah, it doesn't go far enough. No, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, those of you watching, there is a website called um, tosdr.org. I'll put a link in the chat. It's called Terms of Service Didn't Read, and it will actually explain and rate all of the things that it's that, that tell you what you are and aren't agreeing to. So I'll just stick that on there. I'm, I'm really amazed and impressed at the quality of questions that we've got. So I think what I might do is, uh, is come in with a few questions now, if everybody is happy. Please feel free to jump in with your answers. There are quite a few here. So I'm just going to start with a question from Chaim Shai. Hello. Uh, does anyone offer an education program to explain to the young generation in poorer areas how to use and trust these new services? I guess this is a question about disseminating information and, and how do we do that? So this is, no, you, you no, go, go, go ahead. No, I was I, just about to fess up that this is, a, I think, a very important area which doesn't get enough attention because uh -huh. This is one of those things which falls under the collective action problem. Is it, whose responsibility is it to do that? Is it the market providers because they want to onboard customers mm -hmm. or is it the regulators or is it the customers because they are going to be impacted by the harms? Uh, but I think a lot more attention does need to be paid on this uh, 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 education uh, piece. I, I'll, I'll second that. You know, the Financial Times last week launched a new digital literacy um, program um, affiliated with another organization and I forget which. Now that is maybe based on the UK, but I think it'll have global benefit. Now, of course, your average low income person in a, in a, in a, in a poor country is not um, aware of, of that. Um, but the, what they found in some of the studies they did um, was that something like a third or more of the, of the population, even of the US or the UK, um, could not uh, uh, calculate compound interest. Um, some very basic financial concepts. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you were they paying more if, if, if the interest rate was on a compound basis or, or not. Now we found in work we've done in a number of countries um, uh, working on consumer protection issues that, uh, that similarly consumers very often simply don't understand the information they're provided. Um, they may be given, for example, if you're using um, Shuari's uh, um, digital credit in Kenya through the M-Pesa system, um, you'll, be, you'll be told what the interest rate is, but people would not know. Are they being charged that on a daily basis, a monthly basis, or an annual basis? And, and uh, when quoted at something like 6%, it sounds great, except that it turns out that actually um, that's uh, uh, on such a, that, that's on for the loan itself. And if you repay it the same day and then you borrow the next day, which a lot of people do to buy the product for capital, um, uh, for, for operating capital purposes in the market, um, they end up paying literally thousands of percentage points of, of, of interest um, uh, on, on the debt without really realizing, on an annualized basis, without really realizing that, that, that there may be better competitive alternatives. So this education goes to consumer protection, which goes to competition, because if people don't really understand, can't evaluate the, the product, then it's very hard for them to um, switch uh, providers. And so it's, it's going to be very important to getting the costs down and, and getting a more inclusive product uh, in the end. Yes, and it's important to mention that this is nothing to do with the intelligence of people. It's to do with how much they are given in terms of understanding. I, I wonder at this point, that uh, you know, financial assistance could be given by Alexa or Siri or Bixby or Cortana or these, these uh, you know, you could have personalized financial assistance, but then the question is, again, how do we regulate it? At what level of responsibility are we expecting people to take for building this? So this is an absolutely fascinating area. Cam Wajit, I can see that you are aching to say something here. No, I was, uh, when you mentioned Alexa and financial assistance, uh, this is an area that I looked at. Uh, if we look at these voice enabled technologies, they are mostly found in the developed world. If we ask, does Alexa work in languages that poor people speak? Um, the answer would be no. Uh, if we look at Alexa, does it understand the accents of people who speak those languages? Again, the answer would be no. So there's a lot of ground to cover on enabling this for populations who need it the most. Uh, for someone like me, Alexa is just yet another medium to access the power of computing. Um, but for somebody else, it may be uh, an absolute must have because they don't have the other interfaces to interact with these computing devices. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, this is the area of AI is something I could talk about absolutely tons, but I'm going to instead try and get through as many of these questions as possible in the limited amount of time we have left. So thank you for your questions and chats, everybody. It's brilliant reading this at the same time as hearing these incredible insights. Uh, Mark says, what is the thinking on optimizing financial inclusion for the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, um, while ensuring consumer protection and competition as central bank digital currencies emerge? Wow, who would like to take that? It's quite a big compound question, isn't it? So I can jump in briefly. It's a, it's a new area, so I must confess that I am myself a student of this area. I'm looking at central bank digital currencies. And uh, there does seem to be a lot of potential of uh, enhancing financial inclusion with these new central bank digital currencies. But there are a lot of questions to be answered. How, how these systems will be implemented, how they will function, uh, what sort of technology choices will be made, uh, how will the equation of accountability, liability uh, be created, uh, and what would the role of the central bank be in this space? Because when we talk about central bank digital currencies, we are talking about a whole new financial system which is different from how central banks have operated for the last 300 years. Um, I think and it's a very ongoing debate uh, whether the technology infrastructure to bring these uh, uh, um, new technologies such as central bank digital currencies, how long will that take? Like, uh, what will be the role of cloud computing to play here? What will be the role of AI technologies? Are central bankers the right uh, parties uh, at the table uh, to look at the technology options for this? So I think a lot of collaboration um, needs to happen uh, between regulators and technologists for this to become a uh, reality. And there are lots of experiments going on um, central bank digital currencies in many countries. Uh, Uruguay is an example that comes to mind um, and China as well. And just to clarify, I'm, I'm, I think a central bank digital currency, things like uh, a blockchain like Bitcoin, but uh, issued by the state. Is, is, that, is that an accurate read? I'm very new to that bit. I don't know either. So, uh, Mark, thank you so much for that question. It has uh, completely bamboozled most of the panel. And uh, this is the sort of thing that we adore here on the AI for Good Summit. So uh, we're very happy about that. Um, wow, I've only got a minute left. Let me just have a look and see if there's another question that we can manage. Um, I've got, uh, let's see, Alpha from Shenzhen, Great Bay Area. Any consideration about AI for Good? playing as a dimension between human and environment. Do you know what? There's another question here for also about applications of AI in helping environmental products, uh, projects rather, and climate action. So um, I'm going to sort of combine the two and say, um, can we look at financial inclusion and climate action in the same breath? Are these two goals kind of um, possible to merge together? <laughs> that's that's a difficult that's a difficult one. It's a huge huge topic, right? But uh, I, I suppose one connection might simply be that if financial services are about better use and allocation of resources, um, you're going to end up with with less waste one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, you ought to end up with people being able to navigate um, uh, environmental disasters that uh, destroy their homes or something because they'll be able to call on uh, sources of financial support. Um, that otherwise might not have been available. Um, in terms of whether it will actually reduce climate change, it's I guess someone out there can probably bring a link, but it's not one that uh, I'm an expert in. No, oh, it's quite fascinating how everything's connected. Sorry, Alex, off you go. Yeah, just to say that I, I think they're definitely, and, and I think for the, the populations that we're concerned about, you know, I think the their role in kind of preventing climate change, I think is not necessarily the the main issue but sort of building up their resilience in the face of shocks and vulnerabilities that are brought about by climate change and extreme weather events and i think ai and financial inclusion could absolutely play a role uh in terms of you know whether it's kind of uh designing products that are fit for you know the the weather events or kind of using I don't know, geospatial uh, data to predict events and the subsequent financial needs of, of vulnerable consumers. So I think there are absolutely applications in that, in that space um, that yeah. still need to be explored, so. 
And on that note, I have to say thank you so much for all of your thoughts. I wish we had more time. It feels like we've scratched the surface. Um, so thank you, Rory McMillan from Macmillan. Um, no, Rory McMillan, Cam Archit Singh and Alexandra Ritzi. Thank you all to the uh, ITU technical team for keeping us on air and you, the audience, for your amazing time and attention and questions. I've been LJ Rich. Thank you. And it's a pleasure now to hand back to the ITU. Thank you, LJ. Thank you. Thank you very much, LJ, and thank all our panelists for all your great insights. So the recording of the session will be available soon on our website. And for those who are interested, we invite you to join us for the upcoming AI for Good sessions tomorrow, um, 27th of November, we have on the go um, problem owners to problem solvers, helping people build AI solutions on their own terms. And you can see right now all the details in our chat. And next week on Monday, we have an AI for Good keynote with Jean Meister, managing partner of, at Future Workplace on the now and future of using artificial intelligence for human resources. So and once again, you can check all the information now in the chat and we invite you to register for all the upcoming sessions on our website. I would like to thank, of course, all our partners, sponsors and, our, and Switzerland, our co-convener for the continuing support. Thank you everyone and hope to see you very soon. Thank you.